Hello and welcome. This is Hear Her Sports, the podcast introducing terrific female athletes and women in sports. I am your host and producer, Elizabeth Emery. Here we are in the midst of Olympic Games fun. I'm really enjoying watching a lot of different sports. Our guest today, Irish rower Afri Keo, just wrapped up her Olympics in the finals of the women's four. I'm not going to spoil the results for you, but in our conversation, Afrique talks about the team's build-up to the Games, where the team had been strong in recent racing, and what they've been working on in the final training blocks before they leave for Tokyo. I will say that based on how they went in the qualifying heat, their plan succeeded. In the episode, we also talk about nutrition and fueling for such a calorie-intense sport, competing, napping at work, balancing individual versus team training, and the success of rowing Ireland. A quick note, Afrique, as you will hear, was at a training camp in Italy when we spoke. The sound is A-OK, but really not stellar. You will hear some noises from the hotel cleaning crew, for example. I was honored that Afrique took the time to talk to the podcast in the last few weeks before the Olympics. It felt very special and exciting, so I didn't mind dealing with the sound of hotel doors closing. I hope you don't mind either. Now it's time to get to it and hear more from Afrique. Afrik Kio started rowing in 2006 and has been a member of the high-performance team for several years. Afrik's hometown is now Furbica, Galway. She studied food microbiology in UCC and is a member of the UCC Rowing Club. Afrik's highlights include winning the Junior Eights at the Irish Rowing Championships in 2008 and beating two-time world champion Sunita Pushpuri in a 30-minute erg test. In 2020, Afrik won bronze at the European Rowing Championships in Poznan, competing in the Women's Four, and went on to win the silver in the 2021 European Rowing Championships in Varese. Afrique was part of the crew that qualified the women's four at the final Olympic qualification regatta in Lucerne. Well, welcome, Afrique. You know, I am just absolutely thrilled you're here and honored that you're taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. And also an enormous congratulations for qualifying for the Olympics. It's exciting times right now. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, thank you again for your 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 best wishes and compliments. Yeah, it's a pretty exciting time for us and you know, the season is going well for us so far and we've ticked all the boxes so far anyway with one box remaining, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, big box. Yeah. For starters, can you give us an intro of, you know, where you are, what you're doing? You know, I want to know everything about what's happening right now. Okay, so we are in the north of Italy at the moment. We're in a place called Varese. It's in the region of Lombardy. And we're doing a three-week training camp in Italy before we go over to Tokyo for the Olympics. We do a lot of our training camps in Italy, obviously for reasons for weather and because obviously at home we might not get out in the water every day due to wind or rain. So we kind of spend a bit of our time out here during the year, not just in the summer, but sometimes in the winter as well, just to make sure we have a bit more of a pleasant (laughs) training environment. Although this particular region is kind of known for the odd thunderstorm. So that that is a small challenge sometimes. But other than that, it's usually just sunshine and um, flat water over here for us to get our training done. So you're staying in a hotel and, you know, eating in the hotel and all of that? Yeah, so that's all brilliant. So that's all taken care of for us. Whereas at home, obviously, on top of all the training, we'd be, you know, struggling to look after ourselves by cooking X amount of meals a day and trying to look after ourselves that way. But thankfully, when we come in off the water, we just take a quick 10 minute drive back to the hotel and we have food there waiting for us. So that's definitely a nice perk of the situation, too. Yeah, that is nice. And your team, your four and also the larger women's Ireland team, do you guys train together all the time? Like how much of the year are you training together and sort of living in the same zone? We train every day together. We all had to relocate to the south of Ireland in Cork. That's where the National Rowing Centre is. So that's where the whole team trains every day. You know, actually a lot of the team are from that area. So that's good for them. But there are a number of us also who have to kind of just move our lives and move Cork and just, I suppose it's just kind of a the routine we've had for the last maybe four or five years that we all just train together every day. Yeah, in Cork. Yeah. So use the time period that you would like, but what's this Olympic lead up been like? Um, well, obviously for, <laughs> we've had that extra year, but um 
Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of ups and downs, I have to say, even, you know, before COVID and all the delays and complications that that brought about. I started rowing like 16 years ago, I think, at this stage, and I wasn't really ever sure that the Olympics were on the cards for me. You know, I was just kind of taking it as far as I could, really. You know, I, I was lucky enough to get selected for the team, you know, a, a couple of years, you know, back in the uh maybe 2013-14 but I was never really performing you know I was almost just training to get selected and there was a part of the team you know they they were all performing and winning medals and you know at the time our team as a whole probably wasn't as successful there were one or two individuals that were performing and winning medals and that was you know such a big deal and they were kind of seen as you know at the top they're the best of the best and it kind of just seemed very out of reach for me. I was in course training, obviously, but I was also finishing up my master's degree and thinking of getting a job. And, you know, I was just at a stage where I was trying to decide, you know, can I make that jump from, you know, just having to get selected to, you know, actually performing and qualifying and winning medals. And I remember watching the Rio games and seeing how well our crews performed there. And I just kind of thought to myself, right, I have four years here. To, to make it and I'm already set up in Cork you know I'm here I have access to the rowing centre I have everything that I need if I don't make it then it's no one's fault but my own essentially so I remember just deciding right I'm going to give this a go and see how far I get and yeah five years later <laughs> I'm still here you know 2017 was great we raced the Sarasota uh, World Championships raced in a pair and we were lucky enough with our results to be eligible for athlete funding from Sport Ireland. That also then financially kind of set me up to allow me to continue training. The team started to get bigger and bigger. There were a few juniors coming in and we went from having Sunita in the single and our heavyweight women's pair to having three boats at the next World Championship. I was still in the pair with another girl called Emily Hegarty, who's actually in the four with me now. Then there was a women's double, and then there was Tanisha. And that season uh, was very challenging for me. I was working full-time as well as training full-time, and myself and Emily managed to secure a spot in the A-final of the World Championships. And I don't think a lot of people, including ourselves, to be fair, saw that coming. You know, it was a real boost of confidence for us that in the short space of time that we had trained together as a pair, that we had made huge progress. That was my first taste of, okay, you know, it's more than just getting selected now. I am starting to perform at that level because we actually won our semi final to get into that final. Now we didn't actually perform as well in our final, but still the semi final was enough for me to kind of continue on and enter into that qualification year then, you know, with a lot more confidence. What year was that? That was the 2018 championship. Okay. So we were moving moving into the 2019 season then where we would have to qualify for the Olympics. The team again started growing. More and more people kind of, I suppose, saw the success and started to come down for training camps and training weekends. And um, yeah, that season was going well for me. I was seeing a lot of progression in our winter training. And then I think it was around springtime, I just started to feel really unwell. I actually ended up in hospital with a really serious illness. I had um, bilateral pulmonary infusion, which is just essentially, I had a DVT a blood clot in my leg that traveled into my lungs. And yeah, I was just wiped out for yeah. about six weeks, probably more. And that was coming into the racing season for 2019 where we had to get qualification. So the whole team had to re- reshuffle. All the boats had to be kind of, you know, have to seat race for them again. And um, yeah, for me personally, it was a big blow. I had worked so hard that winter. I kind of just started to see my dream slipping away a little bit. I had to stay at home and, you know, I wasn't even able to train. It wasn't like a a situation where, you know, if you're injured, you can, yes, you're not in the boat, but you would normally find some way to work. You might be on the bike or swimming or some sort of cardio um, to keep your fitness levels up. But I felt like I was literally just wasting away on the couch at home while the girls were going off racing. So yeah, that was a tough period for me. But I 
started training then in July again with, I think, about four weeks until the qualification regatta. And there was a young under-23 four that had just won a medal at the under-23s again. In and I was put into that boat then for the qualification regatta to, um, I suppose, I might not have been the fittest and I wasn't like in the best shape, but I was put in there, I suppose, that can maybe add a bit of experience. And we went to the qualification regatta in Linz and I think we ended up coming, I think it was fourth in the B final, so 10th and top eight were qualifying. So we had just missed out qualification and there was a bit of kind of unfair wind conditions too. So we, we did actually feel that we could have qualified through that race on a different day. But, you know, to be honest, like mentally, I wasn't really sure what I was thinking going into that championship. You know, I, I didn't really feel fit. I wasn't my usual my usual self on the starting line where I felt like, you know, I had done all the preparation and I was ready to race. It was kind of a, a weird situation for me. So that was obviously 2019 season. We did qualify our women's pair at that championship. Two other girls qualified that. We went back then the following September to try and qualify the four to get, you know, as many girls as possible going to the game. And that was all going well. I was starting to get fitter and fitter back to myself again when the pandemic started to hit and obviously all those plans were kind of derailed <laughs> again. <laughs> right. We all went back to our family homes with ergs and bikes and weights. And I think we were at home for maybe 12, 13 weeks. And because we obviously hadn't the chance to qualify that boat, you know, we were still training for, you know, what we didn't know if we would make it or not. But I think, you know, in hindsight, that was probably the best thing for us because we couldn't afford to take the foot off the gas at all. You know, we were still training to try and qualify for the game. It wasn't even about performance at that stage. It was just about making sure that we got as many as a squad as possible on that plane to Tokyo. So, yeah, that brought us up to this season. And so far, we, we have obviously managed to qualify that boat. And we're delighted with that. That means that, you know, there's six sweep rowers set to represent us at the Games. We have Sunita in the women's single as well. And, yeah, we're delighted that, you know, we all get to go and compete. I mean, obviously you guys are doing something right. So do you have any thoughts about, you know, like the root of the success of your team? I mean, not just your four, but the entire women's Irish team. Mm. I think it was just about being competitive, like not only with ourselves to, you know, make it into certain boats and, you know, obviously certain seats to be prioritized and everyone wants to get into those seats. And yeah, there was a lot of competitiveness amongst us as a group but also in the wider group of all the athletes on the team. You know, we do a lot of team sessions where your performance is ranked. You know, we have some of the fastest lightweights in the world, and we have Sunita, who's a double world champion. When you're racing against them on, like, a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning doing your race piece, you want to make sure, you know, you get as close to them as possible so that when the results sheets come out that afternoon that you're not bottom of the page or, you know halfway down the page or a couple of percent off, you want to try perform as well as they do because, you know, if they're performing on the world stage and you get close to them, then that might be an indicator of performance for us too, you know, that maybe we could also perform. Also, you know, like we had um, a big change in administration. We had a lot of new coaches coming in in the last three or four years. And a different training program which challenged us all a lot physically and mentally I think you know I think we kind of we're just saying to ourselves we're here training 15 times a week 16 times a week you know <laughs> may as well do it right and get our money's worth essentially you know we were working so hard every day that you know when it came to performances we just really wanted to put all that good work to use like and see how fast we could get the boats going how do you balance that team aspect of the sport? You know, you're in a boat with four people and it sounds like, you know, the team as a whole really wanted to send as many athletes as possible to the Olympics, for example. But at the same time, as you mentioned, you know, you're competing with the other athletes to make sure you're as far up on that page as you can be. Yeah, that is difficult, I think, um, to be honest. But I think 
for us, it does change a lot. Like it's not necessarily the, the same boat consistently at the top of the page, as I was saying, you know, everyone has off days or everyone has good days. And I suppose sometimes our good days might match up with someone's off day. <laughs> so I think it's a good balance, you know, that it's constantly rotating because we're all so close performance wise that, you know, any little like misstep or any little error will, you know, allow that other person to pass you out or you'd come down one ranking or so on. So, you know, I don't think it's a case of the same people consistently performing. I think it just keeps it, I suppose, interesting and fresh. That, and also everyone has a turn, I suppose, of being the fastest performers on a certain day. So, yeah, and I think, like, you know, we're all friends off the water, you know, it's just about if we're if we're beaten by another boat, like, we respect them and we know, well, you know, they're a pretty good crew, like, it's, it's not the end of the world if they beat us because we know they're an excellent crew too. So it's kind of about respecting everyone as well as, you know, obviously trying to be as competitive as possible. You know, I, I mentioned to you in an email that I have rowed, and one of the things that I always thought was super interesting about rowing was the dynamics within the boat, you know, like how the people in the boat need to gel. And it always seemed a little mysterious. Are there tangibles to that? I mean, can you know in advance that a team or a group of athletes are going to gel, or is it as mysterious as it can seem? Um, I think it's quite different for every crew. You know, obviously there's different personalities, and some personalities complement each other, and some people are very similar. And, you know, I think it really depends on the crew. Like I'm very lucky the boat I'm in at the moment, we all get on very, very well. But obviously there's days, you know, we're three weeks into training camp now. And we're coming off to one of like the biggest events of our lives. But there's going to be days where you're cranky and tired and someone says something and you just don't agree with it. And your response might come out of it. I suppose the tone might not necessarily be what you meant or what it sounded like in your head. And, you know, sometimes there is just a small bit of tension, but to be honest for us, most of the time it is just down to fatigue it's nothing personal and we all know at the end of the day we're all here for the same reason and we all wish each other success because obviously if someone else fails then I fail with them you know we all want each other to see each other up there succeeding so we're all working for each other just as much as we are for ourselves but yeah I mean I've heard growing up you know oh you don't always have to get on with the person you're rowing with you just have to respect them but, you know, thankfully, I've never been in a position where I haven't gotten on with someone I'm rowing with. You know, we're, we're, we're all great friends. It's just about recognizing, you know, different personalities and not different work ethics, but almost just people approach sessions differently. And you have to you have to recognize that not everyone will approach a training session the same way that you do. And it's about finding a way that for us to say that it works for all four. You know, someone might like a longer warm up. And let's say the person who likes the longer warm-up could potentially get annoyed at someone who only likes, you know, maybe half the time. And you might say, well, oh, I'm here working harder. Or, you know, you might get annoyed that you feel like they're cutting corners. But to be honest, like, if that suits them, then that suits them. And, you know, you might actually disrupt them by making them go for an extra 20 minutes or something like that. So I think it's just about balancing and figuring out what works best for everyone as a whole. And almost just recognizing the individual I suppose, preferences. Like we're together long enough now and we have a routine. You know, it's not anyone's individual preferences. It's just as a group at this stage, we know what works for us as a team rather than this is the way I would do it if I was by myself. So that's the way I'm going to make everyone else do it. So yeah, I think it's just just about time and I suppose getting to know each other. And as you do more and more events together, uh, you start to recognize kind of what works best and almost I suppose what doesn't work and to change for the for the future. I expect there's a matter of faith, you know, like it's worked in the past, what you've been doing and, you know, yeah. knowing that everybody's working hard and you're all at a top level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think even like, you know, we've done a few training camps together and we've done a, a few training blocks together, you know, you might start to recognize, oh, this person kind of generally struggles in the second week and, you know, you might see a dip in their mood and, you know, you just have to recognize, okay, I know, let's say we're at the 10, 12 day mark now, this is where they usually dip. But, you know, I'll know in five days time, they'll start to pick up again. And just, I suppose, recognizing those subtleties. Yeah, and I think it's about also kind of addressing, like, let's say we're going to Tokyo, we know it's going to be extreme weather conditions, like it's going to be very humid and we might need to make some 
changes to our plan based on that. You know, maybe we might have to do half our warm-up on the land before going out to race because we just don't want to be out in the heat for that long. So, yeah, it's kind of figuring out what works for us, where we're going, what's available to us, you know, at those venues and figuring out the best plan. Are you guys preparing for heat in any way? Yeah, well, obviously the idea of coming to Italy would kind of hope to find kind of a higher temperature anyway than at home, but uh, we have been monitoring the temperature every day. We've had a few days where it's quite high. It's kind of the mid to high 30s, but we've also had a few days where it's kind of in high 20s. So we did have a heat chamber back in Ireland before we left, and we tried to do a few sessions just uh, with quite a high humidity. Um, We tried to do a few sessions in there just to try and acclimatize a small bit, but um, we're we're manifesting that it won't be that bad and that (laughs) we'll be fine. Yeah. You know, the venue's called, I think it's called the Sea Forest or something. So we're hoping there's going to be a really strong breeze and it'll just cool us all down. But yeah, <laughs> best case scenario. What kind of training are you doing in this block, this three-week block? You know, are you working on technique? Are you working in other boats or just staying in the four? Are you doing strength still or balance work or core work? Or what all are you doing? Yeah, a mix of everything, really, I suppose. We are... Just in the four, though, we would stay in the same boat all the time. But yeah, we're still doing a bit of strength work. Still have a mix of kind of long paddling sessions, but also we are starting to bring up the intensity for some race work too. Uh, technically, yeah, you know, I mean, the challenge always is for to try and hold on to your technical changes or to make some more technical changes when the intensity goes up, because obviously that's when fatigue is, is at its highest. So. Yeah, we're kind of at the point now of the block where we're trying to hold on to changes we've made so far. When we're, you know, under pressure and under fatigue, that's obviously a lot easier some days than others. um, Yeah, you know, I think it'll be another maybe week to 10 days of this type of training. And then we'll probably start to to ease off and taper before we travel. And what do you guys think about or focus on or what do you think about or focus on in the boat during the race? Like, where does your mind go? Well, that's probably easy because I'm actually steering the boat. So I have, like, my shoe is connected to the rudder at the stern of the boat. And I'm sitting in the bow. So there's a wire traveling, obviously, down the center of the boat. It would pass through the three girls in front of me. On either side of them, two wires. And then they meet in front of my foot and they're connected. One of my shoes is loose on the footplate. And I kind of rotate it left and right to keep our boat in the center of the lane. So that would be one of my biggest focuses when I'm racing. I do get to points where I'm not thinking about it and I'm almost, I suppose, on autopilot. But definitely the first 500 and the last 500 when we are, you know, going through the gears and changing rates, that would be kind of one of the points where we might have the potential to go one side, you know, left or right, if one side is reacting quicker than the other, the boat will start to turn. So that's kind of when I need to be aware of what's happening and watch the line in front of me because there'll be two lines of boys left and right of us. So I have to kind of keep an eye on if our blades on our stroke side or our bow side get too close to the boys, you know, that's potential to, you know, hit a boy with a blade and that would be, you know, that would could have disastrous consequences essentially. Um, or obviously you never, the, the worst case scenario, to leave your lane and go into a competitor's lane. Oh boy, um, you know, Don't you do could that. get a warning and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you could get a warning or a disqualification for that. But, you know, like depending on where you are, if there's a wind coming from left to right or the opposite, you know, sometimes it's very out of your control. And it's just about managing, you know, as best you can and in in not the best condition. So sometimes it's very easy. I don't even think about it. And then other times it's literally my primary focus. You know, in some ways, some people steer in the the front of the boat because they have a better view of where you are in the lane. But I kind of find it easier for me in the bow seat because the three girls in front of me are then are setting the rhythm and I just kind of slot in. Whereas I feel like if someone was following me and I seemed a bit distracted with the steering that I would be afraid that I'd upset the rhythm, you know, through the boat. Yeah, so for me, if I'm doing it, I like to do it from the back of the boat. But other than that, I think, you know, it's just, it's, the work will always be there. So I do kind of try to think technically and that I think also distracts me of, you know, Not to think of, oh my God, where are we and how much is left (laughs) from the racing pain. Yeah, I try to think technically and then I almost, you know, try to read the field a bit where we are um, in relation to the other crews. 
and I try to relay that then to the girls. If I think we're coming through someone or I can see someone else making a move, you know, speed-wise, I try to alert them to what's happening. The four in the Olympics, it's coxless. So who's giving directions of, you know, when you're going to increase the pace or who's directing the tactics and things like that? So for us, it's our two seat. That's Emer. Yeah, Emer Lam, she's in two and she makes the calls, the kind of strategic and tactical calls, I suppose. You know, it kind of makes sense that someone who's speaking forward, what, you know, the majority of the crew can hear because if Emily, let's say, our stroke girl, was to say something, chances are I wouldn't hear it at all. You know, I'm that far away from her and she's speaking forward. I definitely wouldn't be able to hear anything she'd say. So, yeah, it's usually someone in bow or two that everyone can hear. But Emer, yeah, would do most of the talking in her training and our race pieces because I'm in the bow as well. I would say something every now and again, especially if I think there's something happening with the steering and I think it could be fixed by, you know, someone doing something different. I would relay that too. Um, but also just kind of technically, I don't want Emer to take on all the work and just kind of, I suppose, give her a break every now and again <laughs> and um, help her out just in case she runs out of uh, oxygen coming down the race course. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask about that. I can't imagine being sort of an oxygen debt doing so much work and having to say, okay, up the pressure. Mm. Yeah, well, I suppose it, when we're training, we probably get full sentences out, but when it's racing, it's just <laughs> words or grunts even. Right. <laughs> we kind of know it's like, you know, we've done it so much that we know at certain points, of course, you know, what we're looking to do. It's more about just getting that timing of when to do it rather than, you know, she's not going to spring something new on us um, right, right. in the middle of the race. So it, she might not even have to say anything. It might just be a noise, and we know what, what, she, what, what she means. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have your tactics already for Tokyo? We kind of would have, like, a base plan, I suppose, and it might be something that we would kind of look back over after the heat or, you know, see how it, how it worked. And I think even maybe when we get there, um, after we do a few days training, we'll kind of figure out, what the course is like, you know, if it's going to be a tailwind or a headwind, you might kind of change things a bit. And I think, again, like I said, water conditions, like if there's a lot of waves as well, like that's something else that we need to factor into and just kind of uh, have a focus to, I suppose, deal with that as best we can. You know, it's usually the same kind of rough plan with just a few kind of focuses that kind of change depending on where we are and who we're racing. Who are your biggest competitors going to be? Well, I suppose, obviously, with the year that's in it, we haven't actually raced everyone that will be there. We've raced the European crews mostly, but we haven't raced the American team. We haven't raced, I think, the Australian team. And so, obviously, we're kind of blind to how fast they are. Our main competitors in Europe, we think, will probably be the Dutch and Great Britain. And we raced China at the qualification regatta they they got the other spot for the there were two spots available in our, our event and they got the second spot so we have raced them but yeah purely because i suppose they don't know their speed i think it would be the americans the australians and then obviously are the ones i mentioned from europe too and as spectators because we're all going to watch what should we be looking out for god i don't know if i could predict it i suppose that would be great yeah well i think for us personally based on our previous racing, like we're not the fastest in the first half of the race. And I think a lot of people get to jump on us early and they're out ahead of us. But we tend to kind of come back through them in the second half. Like in Europeans, we were like 0.4 of a second behind the Dutch. You know, I think we left it too late to start coming back on them. So hopefully if we just go that 0.4 earlier. I <laughs> know <laughs> uh, we, we don't really know. Obviously they could have gotten much faster too. But I think for us, our strength in racing is definitely the second half of the race so we tend to try and do most of the damage at that point but having said that obviously we are working on the first half too because obviously that's our weakness and if we can minimize that damage as much as possible then we'll obviously be in a better position coming into the second half of the race. Do you like racing? I do and I don't. (laughs) (laughs) It's very much you know you look forward to it and then when you get there, you're like, oh, God, why do I do this? You know, like with the whole the nerves and just I think it's more a fear of the unknown. Like for me, once I have the heat out of the way and I kind of have an idea of where we stand, I suppose, in the rankings, I feel much more at ease. You know, coming into that qualification uh, race in Lucerne, 
we knew there was two spots and I think there was maybe 10 entries or something like that and we just didn't have a clue how fast China were going to be. We had not race them since 2019 so that was almost two years and you know Russia there's a few other teams that we hadn't raced you know you um you want the first kind of two minutes of the race just to be done and you want to be in the middle of the race and know okay I'm coming second I'm coming third or whatever it is and deal with that then but I think it's just the unknown and the build-up to it that um I don't really enjoy. <laughs> Have you managed to figure out ways to I don't know deal with your nerves leading up to that first race the qualifiers? Mm, I think that obviously it's very crew dependent like a lot of people would prefer to kind of be by themselves and you know not really interact with everyone and just maybe have their headphones in and stay in the zone and go through their own process but for me I kind of like to be surrounded by company and be distracted almost because I feel like if I think about it for too long too far out from the race I'll just be kind of exhausted by the time the racing even starts right so I think for us you know (laughs) We almost kind of get a party going. We get a speaker on um, music and we just kind of chill out together and just try and distract each other as much as possible in that sense. And, you know, very much prepare together rather than individually, often maybe in the corner of each room. We just stay in each other's company. You know, I suppose just reassure each other that all will be okay and that it's, it's also okay to be nervous, obviously. You know, being nervous is a good thing, but... um not to get too caught up in the nerves and be confident that we can deliver a performance. There's a fine balance between being too nervous and not nervous enough. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I find like we had such a big build up for the qualification regatta and I was obviously working on trying to stay as calm as possible. I found myself kind of sitting on the start line with maybe two minutes to go for the race. (laughs) I was very calm and I was like almost panicked at that thought. Like I was like, no, Africa this is important, trying to actually get some nerves into my system to have a bit of adrenaline going off the start. Yeah, no, you're definitely right. I think having a bit of nerves is a good thing and it shows you're ready and, you know, channeling your nerves in the right way can be really powerful. But it's just, I suppose, you don't want to ever get to a point where you're totally consumed by the nerves too because that obviously could potentially um, affect your performance in a negative way too. I always found that nerves showed me that I cared actually. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're dead right. You've mentioned confidence a couple of times, and I'm interested to hear, you know, you said that you wanted to medal in Tokyo, and obviously there's a physical component to that, but there's also a mental outlook about that, you know, being able to say that you want to do that and then you can do that. How did you get to that point? Yeah, I suppose it's it's weird, like even, I suppose, just speaking to you now about my whole process for the last kind of four or five years where initially I was just happy to get selected and then I wanted to perform and you know you start to get into a finals and you know you miss out medals maybe the first two or three times and and then you start to we got I think we got our our bronze in October and then we got silver in in the Europeans in April and I suppose it's just about that kind of feeds confidence and you know you start to build that confidence and start to think okay you know I wanted to get selected, then I wanted to qualify, and you start ticking all those boxes along the way, and it's just a process. And as you kind of move up that process and, you know, start performing, you kind of think, well, why not? I kind of look at my field and I look at the other boats, and I'm like, well, there's only so many entries and three boats will medal. Why can't our crew be one of those crews? You know, if it's, if it's not going to be us, it's going to be one of them, obviously. And I think we're more than capable of doing it and I think obviously there's a a lot of crews out there that are capable of doing it and it's just about who executes it properly you know over those few days of racing and you know it it may very well not be us and that and that's fine too it's just I I suppose about taking the opportunity to try and do everything you can to get to that point and you know if we can walk away and say yeah we came fourth or fifth but I still think we did everything we could, you know, in the lead up to it and we raced as well as we could, then that's fine too. But obviously I, I do believe that if we do, do everything we can do and do it in the correct way, I do think we will be up there, hopefully. Do you talk about the mental aspect with the team? Not like not formally, like, you know, we might bring it into conversation every now and again, you know, we might discuss afterwards, like, 
oh, I was I was so nervous for that or this. And but I, I do think we are all confident enough that we are a fast crew. We do believe that we we can achieve a lot over there. But I suppose it's not really outcome focused for us. You know, we're more focusing in on the process to get there. And at the moment, that process for us is training every day. And you know, we get confidence from doing good sessions and. It's for us, it's about getting as many of those good sessions in as we can. And, you know, then obviously that might result in a great outcome for us. Yeah, we try not to kind of think too far ahead of what our goal is. It's just about the smaller goals day to day, whether it's technically or speed that we're focusing on. I think that balance between process and competition or results is so interesting because, you know, the process is super important, but I think if an athlete gets too wrapped up in the process, then, you know, sort of the, the importance of the results gets lost somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think, like, sometimes for us, especially results-wise, like, we almost don't have the time to even enjoy any success or results we've had. You know, when we medaled in Europeans in April, like, we had a day to kind of recover, but then it was, okay, you have three weeks to qualify this boat. And then when we qualified, it was, okay, there's 68 days until Tokyo. You know, it was just always the next job and the next step. And I think, you know, over that time, we probably individually kind of stepped back ourselves and just looked at what we've done so far. But I don't think, especially with the year with COVID and all the restrictions, we haven't had a chance to, you know, see our families and share those those moments with them or even, you know, had like any sort of celebration with each other because it's, it's literally results. okay fly home, quarantine, COVID test, all these kind of hoops we have to jump through to make sure that we can keep training safe and continue on the journey. So I think we are so stuck in the process at the moment, I think just to keep obviously everything uh, moving in the right direction. But I am looking forward to, I suppose, the downtime when it comes to hopefully just reflecting on it all and enjoying whatever the results we get. Big party. Mm, (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) I want to take this break for a big, very heartfelt thank you to all our Patreon patrons for their financial support. If you enjoy finding out about these fantastic athletes and learn something from them each episode or are motivated by their stories in your own training, we'd love to have your support as well. Financially, you can do that by becoming a Patreon patron. Our most immediate goals are to cover the basic costs of production and to add transcripts for each episode, making the podcast more accessible. Join our other patrons at patreon.com slash hearhersports. At the $5 level and above, you'll get patron-only bonus content. And if you can't do that right now, tell a friend about the show. You can help spread the word about all the incredible women athletes doing their thing. You know, I want to talk a little bit about nutrition because in prepping to talk to you, I watched the Science of Rowing video you did with Dr. Sharon Madigan the nutritionist for Team Ireland. And it was just, it's awesome. And I'll definitely link that in the show notes. Super fascinating. And one of the things that I thought was striking was how difficult it is to fuel properly, to eat properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the number of calories that you guys have to take in. Yeah, I know. Like for, I think, you know, it's funny. The first question people usually ask me when it comes to nutrition is, oh, are you on a diet? You know, a very strict diet. Can you only eat certain foods? You know, is everything monitored and tracked? And like when we're in heavy weeks of training, it's almost the opposite. It's just don't even think, eat. Just get it into you as much as you can, when you can. In our busy days of training, our problem is we don't have enough time to eat. We don't have actually enough hours in the day to sit down. So we're generally just fueling on the go, like in the car on the way home or during our weight session, if we've just come off the water, we're trying to refuel for the session we just did while we're doing the next session, you know. So it's just like a constant knock on of trying to stay, you know, in a good place nutritionally. Even here in the hotel, like we've been here however many weeks and, you know, they're great. They're giving us enough food and, you know, great food as well. But it's just, there's almost like a boredom to the food at this stage. You know, there's only so many ways you can cook pasta. <laughs> we just found ourselves kind of ordering pizza every now and again, just to kind of get some bit of like exciting food, I suppose, to kind of make us want to eat it even. Because yeah, at the stage, sometimes the challenge can be actually just kind of force feeding yourself and you don't want to be relying on shakes all the time. 
like, you know, if we're doing three sessions or two sessions a day, then that's three shakes, you know. And then if dinner isn't up to scratch, then I suppose the next thing would be to go back to your room and have a shake. But, like, you just, at that stage, you're just so allergic to it that you're just like, okay, I'm just going to order a pizza. <laughs> the poor delivery guy, like, our hotel is up at the top of the hill, and there's this poor guy cycling up a hill with about 10 boxes of pizza every few days. <laughs> I think he's just sweating in the Italian heat coming into the reception every day and we're going down to collect them. It is just about volume and getting enough into it for us um, at this point anyway. But, you know, I think the focus on calories and proper fueling is really encouraging for women's sports, don't you think? Oh, definitely. And I think, like, obviously there's two classes in rowing. There's, you know, the lightweight and heavyweight. And I think, obviously, lightweight, yes, they have some restrictions and they need to weigh in on race day. But, you know, the other days, which is like 95% of their training, you know, I think there's no point being restrictive because you'll just end up sick, injured. You won't have the speed because you probably have spent so much time out injured. And I think for heavyweight women, for like when I first started rowing, the goal was to be this really fast, athletic looking rower. You know, I wanted to have that whole physique that I thought, you know, went with speed and the whole picture. But, you know, I think for us, the big lesson is get fast first and the rest will take care of itself, you know, where I was almost like, okay, I need to like lose a couple of kilos. I need to get my skin folds down and I need to get fast at the same time. Whereas I was just totally overlooking the fact that if I ate enough food to get fast, I will be training hard enough to then result in that whole athletic physique that, you know, everyone kind of thinks comes to rowing. So yeah, I think it's just, I was looking at it totally backwards. And now I've finally kind of found the right balance of getting all the fuel into us. And yeah, you know, we try not to eat chocolate five times a day, but you know, we're still eating good foods about getting volume of good foods into you. And then we go for ice cream kind of every second day here as well, just to have something nice to look forward to too. You know, I mean, you sort of, implied it in your answer. But, you know, one of the things in the video that I found particularly fascinating was as your fitness goes up, your ability to push hard goes up, which then increases your need for more calories. I mean, this is totally fascinating. I hadn't realized that the calorie needs would go up in in such an appreciable way. Yeah, totally. And I think, um, yeah, it's kind of just you're going around in circles and it's a vicious cycle, really. (laughs) But yeah, no, like Sharon, kind of our nutritionist was explaining that to us, you know, the more you eat, the harder you can push, but then the harder you push, the more calories you burn and the more you need to gonna refuel. So there's no end really. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's just, you know, as you get more used to that idea and you kind of will know yourself with training loads, you know, what that means for you calorie wise and or meal wise. I think people just kind of start to figure it out for themselves over time. And then you might say, okay, no, I actually didn't do a good job there this week with my fueling. You know, I think I missed a few windows or I should have had a bit more, let's say last Wednesday. And then, you know, you might notice at the end of the week that your recovery is a bit down or your speeds are a bit down or you might have a small niggle. And that's just kind of like a signal or a sign to you, okay, I need to do better next week before it gets too far to the point where, you know, you have an injury or, you know, your speed's really being affected. Right. So I think it's just kind of about staying on top of it day to day, then also kind of looking at it week by week uh, with your load training wise. How are you balancing that, that need for proper fueling so that you can train and do well and be fast with having to think about race weight, think about, you know, the power to weight ratio in the boat and things like that? Well, lucky for us, like that isn't like a huge concern, like racing weight. We generally find that that kind of comes naturally when we start to do higher intensity pieces. You know, you would have a bigger kind of afterburn, I suppose, in a session. And yeah, you might have only been on the water for 40 minutes as opposed to maybe the two hours you would have been on for like a longer cardio session. But there is a greater afterburn and you are burning more calories just even trying to recover. So for a lot of us, our racing weight comes quite naturally like you just kind of drops off as you're coming into competition and then for obviously but for the lightweights on the team like that is something that they would track but again they are just focusing on getting fueled the like power to weight ratio like I think it's not something that you can 
focus on in the last three weeks. Like we just make sure for the whole year that, you know, we're fueled enough and that we're fueling for our training. And kind of like I said, it just kind of takes care of ourselves and we're all in good shape that we know it's not an issue. Could you give us an example of a day of fueling and training and while you've been in Italy, both with quantities and sort of time training, just, I mean, I'm just curious, like what your breakfast looks like, for example. <laughs> so for breakfast, that's, I actually make it myself. The hotel do provide kind of um, bread rolls and cereals, but I just kind of a creature of habit, I suppose. So I brought over orange or oats, essentially, from home. I brought over a couple of bags of that. And I just do, I put, I don't really weigh it. I know it's literally half my lunchbox or whatever. Fill it up with oats and I pour milk in on top of it and some blueberries and raspberries. And I put that in the fridge overnight. And then in the morning, I just take it out and would have some coffee maybe or some orange juice and would tuck into that. Then during the session, we have kind of a carbohydrate drink. So we'd put maybe, I think, one scoop of 45 grams of carbohydrates, I think. So we would put maybe one scoop, two scoops, depending on the session. So generally, our first session could be like 28K of rowing. That could be anywhere between two hours, two and a half hours out in the water of just kind of steady state rowing. So we'd have that carbohydrate drink, which if it was two scoops, would be about 90 grams of carbs. Then we might have like an electrolyte gel, one or two of those in the boat with us that we would kind of take as well when we spin. Then coming off the water, we usually have like a, a shake waiting for us. And I think it's about 500 or 600 calories um, in the shake. And it's just kind of a mix of protein and carbohydrates. So that would be session one done. And that would be breakfast. And then it'd be fueling throughout the session and then post fueling with the shake. Come home, have a lunch, probably a plate of pasta with a meat and some vegetables. Generally go for a nap, <laughs> maybe 40 minutes. And then we'd, I would wake up and have maybe two bowls of cereal or something to kind of set myself up for the next session. If the session, it could be distance again, it could be another 28K or it could be kind of a work session. So the work session, it could be about anywhere between an hour and 90 minutes. If it was a work session, probably wouldn't have as many carbohydrates. I might put like a scoop or a scoop and a half of that drink that I mentioned um, into our water and same you might have a gel or two out in the water again come off the water and we have our shake waiting for us and then we go home for dinner probably very similar to lunch could be rice or pasta and some meat and then if there's a nice looking dessert we wouldn't say no there'll be a slice of cake or profiteroles or something in this hotel anyway and then we probably have maybe two hours two and a half hours before bedtime sometimes I'm okay sometimes I wouldn't a snack, but if I know I have a particularly heavy day ahead of me, I might have another bowl of cereal just before bed to kind of see me over until the next day. Yeah, like that's a typical day. Sometimes, as well as the two water sessions, we might have a weight session straight after the first session. That's kind of where it gets complicated a bit because, you know, you might not have fully refueled from the previous session before heading straight into the gym. So, you know, you might put an extra scoop into your shake. And then you probably have another shake uh, <laughs> after the session too. So yeah, I'm sick of cleaning out these shakers. They're all smelling at this stage just from uh, washing them every day and trying to have them all prepared for each session. It's very, very repetitive, right? which is almost half the problem because yeah, you just get so sick of the same thing. But you know, it's necessary, unfortunately. How are you going to manage fueling in at the Olympics in Tokyo? I mean, I'm imagining it's going to be somewhat harder to get what you are used to. Yeah, definitely. I thought at that stage, though, a lot of the hard work will be done. You know, you won't be doing as long a session, so the requirement won't be as high. Luckily for us, Sharon, the lady that I did the video with, our nutritionist, she's already over there. She left on Wednesday. So she's kind of over there setting up base and figuring out these different options and um, things like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we have a holding camp first. We'll have five days in a holding camp. So I think she has everything organized for there. And then she's heading into the village to kind of suss out that situation. And once we know what's available to us, I suppose we can make a plan around that. And that, I suppose, will be our routine and what we'll carry out while we're there. You know, I think it's just about figuring out the options and what everyone requires. And if they can, you know, if our, our needs can be met or if not, then we usually just tell someone and they try to find the best solution for us. 
But yeah, I think at the moment that's kind of out of our hands at the moment and our team manager and our nutritionists are figuring all of that out for us. And at this stage, they kind of know what we need. So I'm sure they'll try have everything set up to us as close as they can to what we usually do. I'm impressed that Sharon is working with you guys and that the Federation felt that that was important to have her there. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, she doesn't, she, she's not solely working with rowing. Right. She works with all the sports. So, you know, for her, it's very complicated because obviously they all have different needs. You know, some sports are indoors and some are outdoors. So there obviously be different requirements to deal with the environment and all that. She's obviously there with plenty of time ahead of the games to get everything work. So, yeah, I'm sure this is probably going to be some of the busiest weeks for her. But she has a really good team and, you know, our, all our support staff, you know, we're literally the number one priority and they do everything for us and it's all taken care of. It's great. Is it normal for a federation to have somebody like Sharon on staff? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I think okay. most teams would have someone like that taking care of that side of things just because of, I suppose, how important it is. So obviously in Europe, we kind of would go back to the same venues a lot, training and racing. But when it's somewhere that not a lot of people have been to before, you know, there would be obviously a bit more work in terms of organization and planning ahead. This is a little bit more philosophical question, but, you know, you have a degree. You could have chosen not to do sports. So what do you like about sports? Why are you doing this full time? What do you what do you like about it? Um, I suppose it's I don't know, to be honest, like. I suppose for me, I remember a coach saying to us years ago, you know, you only have a certain window to be good at your sport. You know, you might have, as an elite athlete, you might have from your 20s till your mid-30s to kind of make it and to make the most of it and not waste it. Well, he was actually shouting at us not to waste it, you know, going drinking and <laughs> <laughs> enjoying parties. That, that side of the conversation I probably should have left out. But <laughs> um, yeah, you know, he just was kind of, I suppose he was just trying to get the the idea into her head that, you know, you only have a certain window and, you know, you may as well do it properly and not waste it because obviously who knows what each of us could have achieved. And, you know, you can work for the rest of your life, essentially. Work will always be there. People are working until they're 60, 70 and you have all that ahead of you and I suppose not to rush into it. You know, sometimes it is hard. I see my friends kind of progressing career-wise and, you know, obviously getting married or buying homes and things like that. And, you know, for me, that is obviously something that I would like to do eventually, but I've obviously had to put on hold for a number of years. While it might be, they might have more, you might be a bit envious of them at times, but I think, you know, obviously all that is in my future is just, you know, pushed out. So I think, you know, the fact that as well, like, you know, it's, it's very unique. Like a lot, a lot of people get this opportunity to do this. Like you do feel kind of, you know, it feels like, I suppose, special and like you're very lucky to have this opportunity and to do this. So, yeah, for me, I suppose it's just if you love your sport and you kind of want to see how far you can take it, you know, obviously there are other obstacles, like if you can financially do it and, you know, take time out of your career, then it's definitely something I'd recommend doing. Do you have a sense of what you've gained from doing your sport, participating in it at such a level that you'll be able to sort of transfer to other stuff or take with you once you move on? Yeah, I kind of sometimes I, I think about this and sometimes I'm like, oh, absolutely, you know, if I can get through this, I can get through anything. You know, there were some very, very low times in this journey and I'm like, what could ever be as, you know, I'm trying to think of a work environment and I'm like, is there anything I can compare this to? Like, you know, I think it's just like you go through so much personal trauma as an athlete. I can't ever see something similar in a work environment where it's all on you. You know, there might be a, a problem in the office or the company might have a problem, but it'll never be like all on your shoulders. Like there'll be a whole team to figure it out. You know, sometimes I think I'll be so quick for that and nothing will ever be this hard physically and mentally. But then on the other hand, I'm like, we are so far removed from the real world. You know, like I said, like Sharon is out there preparing everything for us. We're going to get everything handed to us on a plate in that sense. You know, everything is done for us here. We just have to show up and do the work in the boat, obviously, yes. But, you know, there's people working behind the scenes to make our life as easy as possible here. So in, in another sense, I'm like, we are living in a dream fantasy world where everything is done for us. And I'm going to go out into the big bad world at some stage. And, you know, none of that will be taken care of for me. 
So in some aspects, yeah, I think, you know, mentally we're very strong people and you would like to think you could, you know, apply that strength into your career. But then there's other times where I'm like, we are going to get a rude awakening when we can't just go (laughs) for a nap in the middle of the day. (laughs) And, you know, like normally I'm like, oh, there's a problem. I'm like, oh, but I have training at 7 a.m., 6 a.m. I have to go to bed now, you know, whereas if you're working and, a client wants something and you can't just go to bed. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I think there's two kind of, I suppose, aspects to it in some ways. You, you could bring nap time to work when you get there. <laughs> you could, yeah. <laughs> bring it to HR. <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you so much and good luck the next couple of weeks. Good luck in Tokyo. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to another episode. Each one is so meaningful to me. I love having these conversations with incredible female athletes, but you are the most important part of all of this. Hearing, enjoying, and gaining something from these stories, and then spreading the word about women in sports. Of course, you don't want to miss any of these episodes with such terrific women, so subscribe for free to Hear Her Sports on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is the last regular episode before Hear Her Sports goes on its annual late summer break. This year, during break for your listening pleasure, I have some special episodes scheduled, so be sure to stay subscribed or subscribe anew if you aren't already. I'm looking forward to sharing some terrific new episodes when we get back in the fall, so see you then. Bye-bye.